widely known fact about Omaha, besides that it's not widely known, is that it's one of the most segregated cities in the United States. I even joked about this in my viral YouTube video, Omaha Explained. Let's take a look. There are at least three different kinds of Omaha, black, brown, and so white that when it snows, 79% of the city is immediately camouflaged. Yes, 16,000 views is considered viral for an Omaha comedian. It did better on Facebook, okay? And it came up again in the admittedly less viral follow-up. We do like our city like we like our face paint with tons of redlining. Omaha's de facto segregation is clearly one of its worst kept secrets. And it's not alone. Cities like Milwaukee, Chicago, Miami, Detroit, and Zootopia are all like Omaha and that they're as racially divided as a Southern color wheel. Well, all color wheels, really. So I've partnered with a research team at The Reader to see how exactly Omaha came to look like this. This is a racial dot map of Omaha based on data from the 2010 census. The orange dots are Hispanic Latino residents, the red dots are Asian Americans, the green dots African Americans, and the blue dots are Smurfs. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's the whites. The patterns of segregation on this map are obvious. This map looks the way it does because of the legacy of redlining. The illegal practice of refusing to offer loans or insurance in a community based on race or ethnicity. You know, just run-of-the-mill evil. To understand why Omaha looks the way it does today, First, we need to examine Omaha's history with racism, violence, and segregation. Ah, Nebraska nice. It's like our Akuna Matata, that phrase Timon and Pumbaa used to avoid coping with their ugly pasts of passing gas and wait. What the hell did Timon do? What secrets is he hiding? Very Omaha of you, Timon. Very Omaha. I talked to Eric Ewing, the executive director of the Great Plains Black History Museum, and he explained that today's black community in Nebraska has roots going all the way back to the 1870s. I had to seek out an interview with Ewing because most Omaha historians only like to talk about Lewis and Clark or the childhood of Warren Buffett, or as I like to call him, Young Buff. During the Great Migration, thousands of black families and workers fleeing the South found their way to South Omaha, where they could find jobs in the meatpacking industry. Omaha meatpacking, creating good jobs and bad smells since the 19th century. At the same time, available housing in the near North Side neighborhood led many of these families to buy and rent homes in North Omaha. This neighborhood was incredibly diverse, home to black people, Czechs, Scandinavians, Germans, and other white Europeans. Black residents flourished in the neighborhood with their own schools, churches, social halls, and stores. Black businesses were thriving and the area became known as Omaha's Black Belt. Who doesn't love a Black Belt? Black belts represent hard work, kicking ass, and breaking boards. So social boards, like, like barrier boards. It just, look, it just sounds cool, damn it. But of course, during all of this, Omaha's white establishment was a constant threat to the Black community because the white establishment is a jealous toddler that hates to see other babies happy. It's Angelica. The white establishment is Angelica, and it's the worst. Horrific things were regular occurrences. For example, in 1919, racist white mobs here in the city of Omaha lynched Omaha resident Will Brown, contributing to a summer of racially motivated violence in the country that led to the year being known as Red Summer. U.S soldiers even ordered black residents to remain in their neighborhood for their own safety. In 1926, members of the KKK burned down the childhood home of Malcolm X. We don't like to tell that story about Omaha, do we? I mean, not when it's Berkshire weekend! <laughs> That's enough of that. Following the 1919 lynching of Will Brown, the injustice of which is beautifully immortalized in the play Red Summer by Omaha's own Bofield Berry, the near north side was officially segregated. Black residents were prohibited from living south of Cumming Street and north of Locust Street. Spoilers, that's how they kept Bennington so expensive. Politicians and real estate agents devised this system of redlining to codify this segregation. They literally drew red lines on a map to set the boundaries of where black families could own or rent housing. Just drew all over the map however they wanted, like Omaha was the face of a Kyle passed out at a frat party. But what about the white families that lived in the neighborhood? What happened to them? Well, the real estate agents had a plan for them too. It was called blockbusting, not to be confused with blockbusters, a completely unrelated practice of refusing to adapt with changing times and eventually succumbing to the ever-changing modern world. Foreshadowing. White property owners in and around the near north side were convinced to sell their homes at low prices by making them fear racial minorities moving into the area. They created a mythical monster just to make money, but not in the, like a fun way, like Mike and Sully, like in a super sad and f***ed up way, like the Red Lobster Dugarita. As white families fled, property values plummeted. The effects of this practice are still seen today in the massive racial wealth disparity that exists throughout the country. In 1936, during the FDR administration, the Homeowners Loan Corporation drew this security map of Omaha to designate which parts of the cities were desirable to live in. Does it look familiar? Do you see any familiar patterns? Can you spot the racists? Hey, Swiper! The pink areas in North and South Omaha were deemed hazardous. 
while the large green area in West Omaha was considered the best place to live. This is what redlining looked like in action. While the 1968 Fair Housing Act banned these practices, it did nothing to eliminate their effects. When we look at the security map side by side with the racial dot map, it's clear that the security map still has lasting effects on our city. It's like a butt print in a chair. It's perfectly molded for the comfort of one particular person or people, but it's absolutely disgusting to everyone else. Omaha today is the 38th most segregated city in the country. 38th isn't so bad until you consider that there are over 19,000 cities in the U.S. For scale, here's a chart where least segregated is represented by the cast of Magic School Bus and most segregated is represented by the cast of Friends. East Omaha has more poverty, lower incomes, lower home ownership, less valuable homes, and more unemployment than West Omaha, which you could have figured out for yourself based on this distribution of high Vs. The massive wealth disparity between white Omahans and minority residents is a direct result of how property values were impacted by redline. Dr. Palma Joy Strand, a professor at Creighton Law School. Ooh. Fancy. has extensively studied Omaha's legacy of redlining. And in a comprehensive article for Creighton Law Review, she explains how the city maintained a status quo of segregation and inequality over the years. Those are legal receipts. Take that, Facebook commenters under WWT posts. Strand cites a 1975 ruling from the Eighth Circuit, which says segregated housing patterns in Omaha were the result of discriminatory state and private actors. And by actors, she doesn't mean those unpaid volunteers at the community playhouse. Strand coined the phrase annexation and SID development regime to describe the means through which Omaha has maintained segregated housing. SIDs, or Sanitary and Improvement Districts, are the mechanism used by the city to develop unincorporated areas that border the city to the west. SIDs give private developers access to municipal bond financing, a fancy French way of saying money, for building housing and infrastructure in these areas. Despite being funded by Omaha tax dollars, the private companies that run SIDs have very little oversight. They can build and do whatever they want, and what they want, shocker, is not to help people. The housing built in SIDs tends to be high-end, single-family housing for wealthy consumers. Such properties are seen as a safe investment as they are certain to sell. Building mixed income and mixed purpose housing, which would help the people of Omaha more, is believed to be too risky. Shame. I bet Bob would have done it. Bob is an ally. Be like Bob. Once these areas are fully developed, the city of Omaha annexes them to rake in the property values, while also assuming any debt that the SIDs accrue. Essentially, Omaha gives the responsibility and risk of developing these areas to SIDs, and the private developers unload that debt back onto the city. There's practically no financial risk to anyone involved in decision making, just the people displaced or to the neighborhoods that have now been price gouged. While middle class and wealthy Omaha residents can afford to buy housing in these newly developed areas, poor families in North and South Omaha are unable to afford them. The wealth disparity created by redlining significantly reduces mobility. They're stuck and the deeply rooted fences of segregation remain in place. So what, Cameron? Why did you bring me here? Why did you drag me through all this just to leave me sad, angry, and ashamed? Why did you season eight Game of Thrones me? Well, unlike HBO, I did it for your own good. For many residents in Omaha, the things I talked about today aren't new. This is as big a revelation as when I found out Trump caught COVID. Let's be honest, you knew it was coming. But for those of you for whom this is new, gas, shocking, huh, and outraging, er, I wanna let you know about some really great organizations in the city that you can support to help out. For starters, we can look to the work of 75 North, a nonprofit that has helped facilitate the revitalization of a healthy, sustainable, mixed income community in Omaha's own Highlander neighborhood, which is different than the Highlander neighborhood the crooked media wants to tell you about. Highlander, there can be only one. And here we are. 75 North uses a three-pronged approach that focuses on cradle-to-college education, mixed-income housing, and community health and wellness to better the community and quality of living for its residents. It's the complete opposite of what Scar did to the Pride Land. And they said I couldn't shoehorn in a Lion King callback. Visit 75north.org where you can learn more and also donate to their mission. And just because it worked once doesn't mean it shouldn't keep working more, whether that's here in Omaha or for cities that face similar long-term effects of racist redlining practices. 75 North base their work on a model designed by purpose-built communities, a nonprofit consulting firm that supports work like this all across the United States and is currently supporting another project right here in Omaha, the Southside Redevelopment Corporation, aimed at revitalizing South Omaha just the same. Learn more about purpose-built communities at purposebuiltcommunities.org. If you're not from here, see if they're in your community. And if not, see if you can get them involved or even draw inspiration on how to change the lives in your city. So go to their website and give them your money. You don't need another latte and you don't need a Halloween costume this year either. We're 
already all wearing masks. Give that costume and candy money to somewhere that needs it. And I know you're lazy. You don't want to Google the same way. I don't want to rake these leaves. Let nature work, damn it. Speaking of leaves, I'm leaving the links to all these places in the comments and descriptions of this video. If you've made it this far, you gotta donate and go learn more. I know jokes about Magic School Bus are fun and we love silly internet, but now it's time to be, say it with me, better people. You brag about it online, so go do it. Lastly, we have to reframe how we talk about Omaha. Many people know a different city depending on where they live. We have to work to know, understand, and better the city as a whole. When the news says North Omaha, that means Omaha. If they say South Omaha, that means Omaha. If they say Carter Lake, well, that's on Iowa. If any of the information in this video was new to you, even that part about me having a YouTube channel, I want to point you towards some really great places that do a much better job than I ever could at highlighting amazing things our city has to offer. But because of everything we talked about today, it might not be as popular to White West O as Junk Stock or Ballast Pumpkin Patch. Check out the work at the Union for Contemporary Art, Culture House, and the Great Plains Black History Museum, which is doing virtual tours now, by the way. All the links are super clickable in the descriptions and comments. So go learn, donate, and engage. Thanks for watching.